So welcome, folks, to another podcast on building high-performance teams. Today, I am delighted to welcome the CEO and founder of Voxify, Steve Fleming. Steve, welcome to the podcast. Great to see you. Thanks, Eric. Great to be here. Steve, as as I always do, I, I'm going to jump straight in with my, my first question. And I wonder, could you tell us uh, a little bit about kind of Voxify and where it came from and what you're doing? And then maybe a little bit about yourself as well in your background or any anything personal about you that you might like to share. Okay, yeah. So maybe I'll start with Voxify. So the idea of Voxify was to push the end users of technology. So people like you and me who use technology every day in the center of the decision-making process uh, rather than kind of back-ended at the end of it, having to deal with it. So, you know, my experience of working in, you know, large corporates and IT departments for 20, 25 years was that IT, you know, for not necessarily bad reasons, um, would make decisions about technology almost in a vacuum. As I think traditionally IT were the experts in technology and the end users kind of said, build it for us, or the business said, build it for us, don't bother us and tell us when you're done. Uh, and as technology evolved and as people's you know, awareness of technology evolved, and as things like you know, iPhones and um, consumerized technology came into people's hands day to day, the, the power balance started to shift or the expectations started to shift. So that you know, six people with computer science degrees, you know, sitting around a table making decisions for 100,000 people who are trying to sell or build technology or, you know, manage people. That didn't, that didn't work anymore. It was starting to break down. So, uh, so what you ended up with was you have, you have people trying to deal with technology that they weren't involved in scoping or specking or designing. It wasn't designed with their individual needs in mind. It was designed with a big business process in mind. And so I always used to have this, this, this image of like a poor salesperson would get up in the morning full of hope and enthusiasm, you know, kiss the family, pat the dog, go into work full of, full of excitement about, you know, what they're going to do. And then they, they run into IT and they run into technology and they run into systems. And by the end of the day, they come home, they're so stressed and angry that they kicked it off. That, that was the kind of image in my mind. And that was a problem that I just, I wanted to solve because technology to me, so I'm, you know, getting into my background a bit. I'm a UCC engineering, electrical engineering graduate. Um, science and technology is something I've loved since I was a small boy, like a lot of people in IT. And so... And I think the, the worst experiences I have with IT are that I, my expectations are very high for it. I get very frustrated and I'm impatient. But other people, I've seen them get genuinely upset when they can't use the technology. And what they do is they blame themselves and they say, I'm bad with technology. I need to improve my skills with technology. And I, my position is, no, you're good at what you do. The technology is getting in the way. The technology needs to be more people literate. Technology needs to understand you better. And then even as we start to move into this kind of data-driven world where people are now starting to say, we need to be more data literate. Now we do to a degree so we can understand things like, you know, COVID growth rates and how effective are vaccines. That's all very topical and important at the moment. So we need a minimum level so we can scrutinize data. But the data, the technology, the systems need to wrap around us, not the other way. Excellent. Excellent. That 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 makes so so much sense. That uh, human-centered approach to design. And Steve, can you can you tell us a bit more about about you uh, yourself? Anything anything personal about you that you you'd like to share? The I man think, behind yeah. the CEO. Um, like I've said, so I, I I'm from Cork. Grew up in Cork City. Um, I grew up originally in Toker, Bishopstown. Ultimately, right now I live in Black Rock. Um, but science, technology, you know, has, has been something I've been interested in since I was small. I remember actually getting a radio, an old radio that was broken, open, not knowing what it was, opening up the back of it, yeah. taking out the transistors, the resistors, the capacitors, the whole lot, 
And it was like sweets. It was like Dolly mixture for me. Now, I didn't know what any of them did, but I knew they were all great. It had yeah. some, and I knew I wanted to be connected with that. Yeah. And then in primary school, somebody brought in a, a Sinclair Spectrum. Uh, just somebody from one of the boys from the class above brought it in, gave a demonstration. And I was 10 years old. And that day I knew this is what I'm doing with the rest of my life. I am doing technology. But at the other side of it, then sport has been a huge part of my life. So I like, I suppose, most people who get into sport at some point, you discover you're you're fast. In my case, I was fastest in the class. You know, you'd, you'd have little races at, at, at school and it kind of went on from that. So I went from being just a fast kid who liked playing lots of different sports into somebody who represented Ireland for 12 years uh, at the international level. Wow. Um, and so it's the balance of, and so I suppose technology, science and technology has driven my career. And at the same time, it's been trying to balance that with being a high performance athlete. Uh, and I think the combination of the two then, in some ways inevitably leads you to a place where you want to, you know, when you leave the sport behind, you want your career or your life to kind of operate at the level of the sport. So you want to bring passion to it. So you want to bring, you know, the, the components of high performance to it. And it needs to be kind of fulfilling in the way that sport is really fulfilling. Um, and so it's the balance of those two things together, I think are probably two of the main drivers for, you know, how, you know, how my life has gone and, and probably ultimately leading to trying to set up a startup, which is as, as risky and as crazy as it kind of gets for, uh, for an ex corporate person. I think that's, that's, that's a super story. And, you know, uh, it's, it's what you're saying about performance there. I, I've interviewed a, a couple of CEO founders for startups and I often I often look at what they've done. You know, they've taken an idea, just just like you, Steve, taken an idea that you have, you've backed it with belief and you know a determination to start up a business. And like already with Voxify, you guys are starting to fly, you're starting to become successful even at this early stage. And to me, um, and I'm sure to a lot of other people looking at this, to me, that that's shows such strong leadership to be able to take those kind of bold leaps, which kind of leads me nicely into my, my next question about, you know, what, what leadership means for you. Yeah, and I, I think what you, probably the words you said there around bold steps, um, I think that's kind of the key for it for me. So again i've been lucky to go through a lot of kind of corporate stuff a lot of really good companies with really good training and really good management programs and really good leadership programs and often you get the question of well how can i lead if i'm not a manager and if i'm a manager how can i lead and this kind of overlap between management and leadership and and in my mind they're two distinct things you know management is a set of it's kind of about control and it's about skills, the skills of management. And it's almost, it's about your position in some places. So you're, you're anointed a manager or you're made a manager and now you have the responsibility to, to control something and to lead something. But leadership is a different thing. You can be a leadership as an individual without responsibility for other people. And, and a lot of the most prominent leaders, I suppose, in, in history have been in that position. But what, what kind of comes through to it as I was thinking about it is, you know, it's, it's more about empathy than control. It's more about inspiration than it is about position. And it's probably more about courage than it is skill and the courage to take that bold step into the unknown. Mm. Number one is probably where it starts. So it's self-leadership and, and making that first step is often the most difficult thing. For me, that was the most difficult thing, taking the first step. And then the next part of it is bringing people with you. It's people you're directly responsible for as you start to build up the team and become a manager. As a startup, you're always, you've always got an eye on investment. So you're trying to bring VCs and angels and whoever around you, maybe even the banks, if you're taking a loan, you're trying to bring them with you. So they understand your journey and they see there's value in it. And you're trying to bring clients on the journey because 
I'm asking clients to do something they've never done before or they've done in a sort of unusual way. And I'm asking them to trust a startup. Now, they could be an enterprise of 50,000 people. Yeah. And I'm asking them to trust me with their data, with their future to some degree. And so I, I think those are elements of leadership. You know, the courage to take that first step yourself, the courage to go into the, the unknown and then asking other people to have the courage to go with you. I think, I think that's a large part of it. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and the other side of it then, I suppose, just kind of closing the, the point about leadership versus management. Management seems to me, and this is in no way, obviously, to, to, to diminish management. It's, it's, it's critical and difficult and you know, not everyone is cut out for it, but management is probably more closing stuff off bringing things to a conclusion, cutting off distractions, getting very focused on bringing something in on time or on budget or whatever, where leadership is probably the opposite. It's opening it up. It's inviting different opinions, inviting discussion, inviting ambiguity, inviting discomfort, inviting the unknown, bringing in all these things so that you probably have to lead to go wide. And then at a certain point, maybe then you you start to have to manage. The management comes in to narrow it down to really start to deliver. And, and you know, I'm not sure that's everyone's perspective on it. And um, but I think those are that's kind of how I think about it. I suppose. Mm, that's a. I don't think I've heard it described like that before, but it 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 makes so much sense. Uh, I really like that perspective. Um, for, for you, Steve is. Has kind of leadership been more a planning versus intuition? Where do you think it, it lies more for you? What's been your experience? It, it's, it's a combination of both. So <laughs> my, my sister-in-law, just this is a bit of an aside, but it's sort of related. Um, Christmas dinner a couple of years ago, she said, Steve, do you want, uh, do you want pudding or a trifle? And I said, I want pudding. And then trifle. So, <laughs> so coming back to your point about um, what you were saying, it, it's kind of a it's a cycle of one then the other and one then the other. Because <clears throat> your mind was the question again, actually. So uh, planning versus intuition. But, where would it yeah? Hmm. So for me, it starts with gut. It right. starts with my yeah. gut. I really have a good feeling there's something happening there. So then it's. Yeah. It's, it's intuition and then it's probably doing something to validate it and it might be a whole ton of analysis and spreadsheets and I just throw massive amounts of massive amounts of data at it yeah. until I get sick of it and then intuition kind of comes in to close it down so I try and make sure you know the intuition definitely comes first the gut goes somewhere first and my instinct is to kind of run in that direction and find my way through it yeah and um, and then the, the analysis and everything just to make sure I'm not doing something totally stupid. And yeah. also there's other people I have to influence who need to see that data to yeah. see this isn't just an idea Steve has, this is real. And then the planning is right. How do we actually execute on it, which is critical. So if you have the, all the intuition and all the analysis and you don't have a plan, then you've got an idea, you don't have a business. Yes. And so yeah. actually in the last, in the last few months, um, it kind of goes in cycles of planning and then just running and going and doing stuff and then stuff gets a little bit out of control and then you have to go back and plan again. So I think it is, it is cyclical. That makes, that makes total sense. And I guess from, from coming from um, a startup founder, it's, it's not surprising that intuition in your gut is so strong that like that's where your kind of ideas often come from. I'm guessing. Yeah. 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 And, and and but again it's it's also you you have to have a certain amount of doubt because you're you're running into a, a kind of a scary place in a way a, a very unfamiliar place where there's a lot of risk and so challenging and so periodically and even through startup accelerators i would go out and test out you know 10 different alternative approaches yeah. to see, well, maybe there's a better, maybe this is a better market here. Maybe there's a better product here. Maybe there's a different type of customer here. Um, and a lot of it, I'm happy to say, is kind of ruled out things 
rather than forced me to pivot in one direction or another. So it's been good kind of validation that the gut yeah. was right. Um, and I keep coming back to it. So, But I think it's the discipline of having the gut, but not blind belief. Um, yeah. There has to be some discipline around your thinking as well. Yeah, that makes total sense. You know, Steve, you're like looking at your career and, and certainly your your time working in the corporate world, you've had like so much experience in working with high performing teams and now you're I guess you're building your own team with Voxify uh, today like what what are you what will you be looking for in your team what what do you see as those kind of key performance indicators for a high performing team a really tough question um <clears throat> and again it's another evolution so when you're when you're hiring in a in a corporate and you've got the support of HR, and certainly what I was trying to do was trying not to be biased by my own experience. So I did electrical engineering at UCC. If I see a CV coming in with electrical engineering and UCC on it, I may be blind to everything else on that piece of paper. Whereas if somebody comes in with a different degree, there's a there's a there's a there's a risk that you might rule somebody out. So it's trying to switch off your bias um, and and not focus on what you know, which is people who are like you, because there aren't that many people like you anyway, for better or worse. Mm. Um, so then really I think it's what I'm looking for is some evidence that somebody has performed at a high level before. So, you know, someone who's joined the team recently, and I'm not going to mention names, has experience in uh, army special forces and um, i mean that's a that's a tough risky high performance environment that i'm unfamiliar with but i but i understand that you know it takes a certain degree of character to be able to perform in that environment and that's a kind of i think that's certainly an attribute that is valuable yeah. um, in a startup uh, and and other people in the team have got other kind of high performance backgrounds which are very difficult different from mine so i think looking for something where somebody has the qualities of, you know, leading themselves, being able to take a risk, having good judgment, being able to perform in a risky, difficult, uncertain, pressured environment. Yeah. So I think it's probably looking for those qualities which are consistent across the people working is something I'd look for. And then also trying to balance my strengths um with their strengths so you know there are things that i'm particularly strong at and there's lots of areas where i'm particularly weak i can do just about enough to get it going but then i hit a wall and it's bringing people who are certainly very strong in those areas or the potential to become strong in those areas yeah. which are not strong for me um and then the potential to grow as well into into new areas so yeah. it's really trying to find people aligned around being able to move forward certainly at this stage of the business it may change in a year or two's time yeah. um but certainly it's about the people who are comfortable going into the unknown um, yeah. and comfortable growing into areas that uh you know extending their comfort zone yeah that's and i love that that um diversity of background as well that you're looking to kind of have a more uh uh, have a more what's the word i'm looking for a, a broad view of like in, anything that you're going to be presented with having those different backgrounds looking at it together makes you stronger um yeah. i particularly like the idea that you know it 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 might take someone with a special forces background to be strong enough yeah. to go into the startup arena which you know is absolutely true in so many respects and it's I find it really interesting as well, Steve, that you're you're aware already of like what we need now in terms of building a high performance team is it's going to be so dynamic and it'll change as you grow and develop. Um, have you like are you what are you what what are the kind of biggest challenges you're facing today or that you're you're perceiving might come down the line with with regard to building a high performance team? Um. I think probably I'll give you a, a specific example. So there's another member of the team. He has sort of a military background, different different kind of military background um, in signals intelligence. 
in the in, US. In, in, in what is it? What, what? Signals intelligence. Signals so it's almost like, right. you know, it, it's more of a security type role. Right, and okay. so he's, he's, he's working as kind of chief information security officer and CTO at the same time. And so I'm not on the same end of the spectrum in terms of security as he is. He's very far out on that end of the spectrum. Yeah. And I'm much more like, well, can we drive on? Can we drive on? Can we drive on? And so we have these discussions then where he's saying, this is a risk. This could happen if, if this happens and this happens and this happens. And so the, I have to, and he's new into the team and I'm coming from the position of, you know, I had total control of everything up until a certain point. So it's relinquishing some of that control to him and saying, well, actually, you, you know about this. And I have to trust you and I have to let go a little bit and close my eyes and just let him drive on with it. Um, and I think that's a large part of it. It's, it's relinquishing control. It's giving people trust. And I think Ernest Hemingway said it best. He said that the only way you can really know if you can trust somebody is to trust them. Yeah. And so I think, I think that's it. That's the evolution path, giving him enough control and trust and freedom that he can build it up the way he wants to. Now we're going to disagree about some stuff, but giving him ownership of that and giving someone else ownership of sales and giving someone else ownership of marketing and someone else ownership for product and so on. And I think that's it as a, as a founder, as you grow the team, you're relinquishing control, but you're actually growing the opportunities and you're growing the potential for the company because I'm going to limit the company if I control everything. Yeah, There's that's... another good quote, actually. Mario Andretti, the uh, Formula One driver said, if you're in total control, there's not much happening. Right, okay. <laughs> the, um, I, I, you know what, what I particularly like about what you're saying there, uh, Steve, is it's like the CEO startup perspective that they're understanding, uh, being, being almost objective in terms of your capacity and capabilities, and being able to being able to kind of relinquish that control, being able to pass other pieces on to other people who are probably, you know, as you're saying, they're they're going to be better at it anyway. This is their thing. This is what they do. And okay. yeah, but the better uh, so, at it than I'm ever going to be. And then and they're you, someone else. You you have to try and get people around you who are smarter, who are ideally domain experts, but who are smarter than you. Yeah. And accept, like, get over the ego problem as a CEO or as a founder that you're doing it because you're the smartest person around. You're not. Yeah. You're by well, no means the smartest person around, but you have an idea and you had, you took the risk and you did it. But you really then need to get smart people to, yeah. to make sure that things survive. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really that's a cool insight. You know, Steve, is is have you seen kind of challenges today in like I know the team is is relatively small. Uh, at the moment, but have you seen challenges? Are you seeing changes in terms of kind of leadership in this kind of new remote work era? Have there been particular challenges for you guys or changes that you've had to make because of COVID, etc.? There's a, there's a lot of positives about it in one sense, because, you know, video conferencing has become more accepted the idea that you have to travel and have meetings face to face. So all of my clients right now are outside Ireland. And never mind outside part, they're outside Ireland. They're very far away. They're in different time zones. Um, so if I'm having those meetings and I'm having to go on a plane or I'm having to install a, a local salesperson, that's really difficult as a startup. So this has been a huge benefit to be able to get into those markets with people accepting that you're not going to travel. And I would kind of be hopeful that that would continue. Yeah. But that's more of a kind of a sales motion. But in terms of building the team, I find the, the biggest challenge is you, you, you have to schedule conversations. You can't lean over and tap someone on the shoulder and go, I was thinking about this. Let's go over to the whiteboard and sketch it out. And this just came up. Um, it's a lot more formalized and you have to do things to deformalize it. But you even have to, you almost have to schedule fun and schedule things, which I find completely counterintuitive and, and, and quite difficult. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting back into, at least for the kind of core team, you know, like the software development has been done offshore since day one and that works pretty okay, but there are still 
areas where you want to just sit down with somebody and say, here's what I meant. Yeah. But for yeah. the, the core leadership team, you know, I'm looking forward to getting us all into an office together at least, a, you know, a couple of days a week so we can sit down and just have that more natural flow of conversation. And I yeah. think as much as digital technology has advanced um, the last few years and, and the last year in particular, you know, that extra dimension of, you know, we can, I can see you, I can hear you, um, but I, I, I have no depth perception around where you are. I'm not picking up little micro gestures and yeah. um, whatever the other senses we have to relate to each other as human beings are completely shut off um, by this. So it's just purely 2D color vision, whatever you can hear. Hopefully there's no lag on the, on the video so we're not tripping over each other. Yeah. But there's a whole set of etiquette around being able to communicate in, in, in this way that you don't get in a, in a normal real world situation. So I'm looking yeah. forward to having more of that in terms of the collaboration, the collaborative type stuff, the relationship building, but in a lot of other ways, being able to run three or four meetings back to back from, you know, from, from a desk without having to get on a plane or a bus or a, a taxi is, is, is great as well. Yeah, yeah. What, what are, um, you know, in terms of, that's a, like what you're saying there about that interaction piece, I, I, I've loved the, the digital interaction over the last kind of 12 to 18 months. I've seen a lot of benefits in it. And a couple of people I've spoken to as well recently have highlighted that there's been a lot of good that we've got from, from digital working. But um, every, everyone does come back to, we, we haven't quite solved that, that real human interaction in a digital format yet. It's just, it's just not, not possible. Um, I don't know. Is, will a VR set do it? I I don't know. I don't know. But in a, uh, in a way, in a way, I kind of hope we don't, because right, okay. it's, it's so valuable yeah. to be in a in a in the same space with somebody. I mean, yeah. you know, if we solve enough of it so that it's workable from a from a professional point of view. But I would hate a world where we ninety percent of our interactions with other human beings are through a screen. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I totally, I can totally understand that. We do. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a natural thing for humans to want to interact with other with other humans. What what are the kind of technologies that have been kind of number one for you um, over the last you know six to twelve months? It, well, you know, I I actually I was gonna so we're doing this on Zoom, so it's gonna yeah. say Zoom. So I use Zoom a lot, and I find I, I don't want to be name dropping any particular product or another, but yeah. I find that very useful because it's it's very easy to use, and it's very easy to do screen sharing, and and probably as much because I'm used to it and I use it so much, yeah. I'm very familiar with it. But I actually use four or five different uh, video conferencing technologies depending on who I'm speaking with. So yeah. I use Teams, I'm going to use Skype, and I use you know all the different tools, um, but that's been a really big one. Um, yeah, I think as well instant messaging. But again, it's another it, it's another kind of um, situation where we've got a number of different instant messaging tools. So we use Slack, we use WhatsApp, we use Signal, we use Skype, uh, depending on who I'm talking to and depending on on the context. Yeah, um, and I think just being able to quickly tap somebody a message. Um, during the day without having to fire up a whole conversation with them yeah and um, the uh, video conference has, has been has been great um and obviously i'm hugely rely reliant on broadband so yeah. we've got really fast broadband here that's made such a difference um yeah just in terms of continuity of discussions but it really is it, it's it's the collaboration technology primarily that has been uh has been the bulk of of, of where we've been spending time do you do you think that the, do you think that is has kind of leadership and the how we use technology do you think that's changed forever going forward based like we've gone from kind of a yeah. we're, we're in a remote work era now you know there, there'll probably i'm get well it's hard to say really but I, i'm guessing i'm hoping to that there'll be some element of it everywhere um do you think kind of the fundamentals of leadership and how we build teams has, has changed because of this? Or, or, or is it the same? Is it the same fundamentals, but maybe applied in a different way? It's probably put it on, it's put the fundamentals under pressure um, 
for sure. And by the way, another technology actually was collaborative editing of things like Google Docs. That's actually been very, very helpful. Um, but I, I think I don't think fully remote working is the future. I think some form of hybrid working. So, you know, um, in a previous um, role, I had analyzed the difference between engagement surveys and IT experience surveys. Yeah. So in the engagement survey, the people most likely to recommend a specific company were the ones who were working remotely and the ones who were least productive with technology were the ones working remotely. So there was a technology gap then and there probably still is. But it, it seems to me and, and from looking at the data, what people want is the flexibility to work remotely or in the office or on the road as suits their their you know their their lives yeah. rather than the requirement to work remotely or the requirement to be in the office so i think that's the world i hope is going to move towards more enabling people's uh, lifestyles and work styles so they can be where they need to be um with the least amount of disruption to to their day-to-day -day lives i think i think that's this whole remote working thing has probably opened up that as a possibility. Yeah. Um, and more companies are going to be open to flexible working if they can figure out the finances and so on. Yeah. From a leadership point of view, I think leadership is leadership and management is management and all of those things are the same, but I think they've been put under more pressure. So there are people who've worked for me and have been into the company and they're out of the company who I've never met, um, not even once. Everything has been done over email and video conferencing and phone because yeah. of COVID. Um, and that's an extraordinary thing. Yeah. Um, and but what it does is that whole process then relies on, you know, you trusting that there isn't a Wizard of Oz situation going on where they're putting on a nice song and dance, a nice display while they're on the video conference. And then as soon as the video conference goes off, they're playing Call of Duty or something like that. Right. So having obviously you know finding ways to make sure that the people are the right people yeah. that you can work in a way where trust is 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 uh, implied and required and assured because you can't manage by walking around you can't stand over somebody's shoulder and make them do a lot of tasks it probably puts good management practice and good leadership practice um or in focus than it used to be because now you're relying on being a better manager you're relying on being a better leader yeah and the old ways of you know standing over somebody they just can't work anymore and i think they're hopefully gone forever yeah but that's and it comes back to the trust element you were talking about earlier i mean that's yeah. it's kind of fun it's it's the starting point for everything really without it if everything else falls apart uh, Steve, the, the last question I'd like to ask you, and uh, I have to admit, I've been really looking forward to asking you this one in particular because I, I know your your background oh, is a, <laughs> I know your background as a pro athlete. Um, uh, is you know, you know, coming into a startup, being the CEO, like you have to be, you know, on it, like almost almost twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. And I'd just like to know a little bit about, you know, how you bring the best version of yourself to work all the time, how you maintain yourself to, to, to perform at that high level, what sort, of, what sort of things you do. It is difficult. And there's, there's pluses and minuses to having been a pro athlete. So when you're a high-level athlete, when you're a high-level athlete, athletics and sports becomes a 24 7 365 thing even in the couple of weeks off you have in september you're still kind of thinking about it mm. um and you're always thinking about but you're thinking about you know should i eat this should i eat this now should i eat this later how am i going to get my recovery how am i going to be fresh for training because if you mess that up as an athlete you're not going to be able to perform and you're going to get sick and you're going to get hurt and um, but you still have the the engine and you still have the you know the drive to go and do more and work hard and almost work yourself into the ground so you have to learn the discipline as an athlete to stop yourself physically breaking down 
now as a CEO, you're kind of in an all consuming world again. Now you've taken the work world and all the time spent in athletics and you're like, I can spend all day at this. I can spend 24 hours a day at this. Um, and I have the engine for being an athlete and I have the persistence to drive on. But then you've got to bring in that, that, that kind of protective mechanism as an athlete to say, actually, I know in my head, this isn't sustainable. Yeah. So you have to be very, you have to be very disciplined about it. So it's about, I think it's about setting boundaries and like with COVID, it's even worse yeah. because you're at home all the time. So there's no boundary. There's no physical boundary between work and life. It's just open the door and that's it. That's, that's the house. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So I think it's establishing clear boundaries between, you know, I'm going to finish at six or I'm going to finish at seven instead of saying, I can stay here till nine, so we'll stay here till nine. And then go home and then you're dead and you have to go to bed um so it's it, it's establishing clear boundaries so that you you switch off and you intentionally switch off and you put the phone away <clears throat> and you try not to think about it yeah. as much as possible and then the other side of it is scheduling in rest and recovery and exercise yeah so making sure you go even for me right now it's going for, going for a walk so like we've out here in Black Rock, great walks around the marina and everything. So I try and go for an hour walk a day. Um, and it's good because it, it clears the head out from work. It creates a nice separation between work and, and life. And yeah. then from a, a cardiovascular, physical point of view, it's, it keeps me somewhat healthy. Yeah. You know, I want to go to the next level now where it's not just a walk. I can actually go and run and, you know, go to the gym and things like that. But yeah. at a minimum, I think it's making sure... You're creating space to to do exercise making sure you're creating space and even scheduling this we're creating yeah. space to recover and making sure you're eating as well as you can i used to have a, a sign on on my fridge um that my again my sister-in-law she she was like steve now make sure you don't work 24 7 and show up at my house with black and blue eyes and white yeah. skin so I used to have a sign that says, James says, eat, sleep, exercise, hydrate, uh, just to remind me that, you know, we don't get lost in this world of building the startup. Yeah. There's still tomorrow, there's still next year. Um, but I think creating discipline about those essential things that keep you, you know, fit and healthy and rested in body and mind, I think, um, the discipline just to plan it in and schedule it in. I think that's that's what's helpful. Yeah, I I I think that's fantastic to hear. I've and I've I've heard a couple of people talk about eating, sleeping, and exercise being absolutely fundamental. I think it's interesting as well. You said there, put away the phone. It's just so easy to pick up an email at like nine o'clock at night, and then your your head is gone again. Um, yeah. when you, you need that downtime to to perform at your best on, on an ongoing basis that's uh that's that's really fascinating to hear and it's it really sounds like steve you've kind of taken the the discipline from the 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 athlete steve into the ceo steve it's it's, it's a very similar kind of process um to to, to maintain yeah. performance in those two areas and for, for me, it's critical. I think it's that word discipline is, is probably the most important ones. And then you apply discipline to all other to, to different aspects of, of the business and your life. But it, I think, you know, finding ways to maintain that discipline and planning stuff in and, and having some kind of structure in a world that's inherently chaotic and unstructured, you know, bring applying structure to it is I think what's really helpful for me. And, and that's what's going to make it sustainable in the long run for me, you know, for the team and for the company. Fantastic. Well, you know, based on, on what I know of Voxify and some of the people that you've hired, like, you know, serious players, uh, I think it's, and, and the success you've had already, Steve, um, you know, I'm sure the next time we'll be talking, it's going to be a much, much bigger company again. I, I wish I wish you and the team and Voxify absolutely the best luck. I think it's an absolutely superb product, very, very much needed in today's world. And lastly, just look, I'd like to thank you for your time today. It's been a pleasure talking to you and listening to your, your, your views and leadership and performance and Voxify. Uh, uh, really, really, really fantastic stuff there. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Darren. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it.